Welcome back. And reflecting global trends, the discerning South African drinker is becoming less interested in the ubiquitous mega brands that have monopolized our shelves and bars for so long. It is more likely to try interesting new offerings with a strong and authentic story. Now, all of this is according to Rowan Librant, owner of the Truman and Orange Premium Drinks Company, along with Stephen Carroll of the Bleeding Hearts brand. And I met up with them a short time ago to find out more about this change in consumer sentiment in a bar. Where else? Something's happening in the global liquor trade. Tastes are changing the world over. Yeah. Tell me what's happening. I think two things are happening. I think people are realizing that there's so much more versatility in different uh, products, which may have been a little bit monolithic before. It's happening in American whiskey, it's happening in uh, scotch, it's happening in gin, it's happening in, in rum. But also they're looking for stories. And a um, category like rum, for example, it's full of stories. It's not just pirates in the Caribbean, but it could be plantations in Cuba. It could be, you're talking about moments in the Nacional in Havana, or it could be little specks in the Philippines that also produce rum. Why do you think consumers are looking for those stories? I think they, they're, they're a little bit tired of monolithic brands being rammed home to them on TV advertising, and they're looking to discover uh, there's so much more choice nowadays, so they're looking to be able to discover almost their own stories and, uh, and I think spirits uh, have that in spades. Ron, what's your view? Much the same? Is it, what, what's happening in this market? Because there's been a sea change. It's kind of really interesting because I think nowadays what, what some of these brands need to offer, there's, there's almost a kind of a demand that brands offer, not just this kind of fantastic product that you taste, but there's, there's a kind of a need for them to offer this sort of entertainment value piece as well. You know, the new age brands or kind of modern brands now, they need to have dimension, they need to have stories. People want to know where they're from, they want to know who made it. And there's a, there's a kind of an interesting sort of thing that happens in the sense that, you know, people drink the product and they kind of want to talk about it in a much higher level of engagement than we've Really and we'll get, we'll get to marketing around that and how to capture that in just a moment. You talk about wanting dimension. I don't understand. What does that mean? They, I mean, if you pick up the Don Papa bottle, it, 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 it's, you can almost kind of see the sort of multiple levels of storytelling which are going on there. And I, I describe, you know, the, the new premium, you know, premium used to be um, made somewhere far away, sitting in a barrel and um, left for a couple of years. That, that used to be what people kind of accepted as premium. Now in, you know, certainly in kind of, in the sort of premium end of, of uh, brown spirits, premium needs to mean so much more than that. People want to know exactly where it's from. They want to know the sort of odd family who made it and the sort of strange place that Steve, it's from. Steve, you were going to say? I was going to say, and also, you know, how it's packaged. So, for example, rather than just a straightforward uh, glass that scotch has been in for, for 100 years, it's, you know, it's, it's a sort of heavier glass bottle. It's almost a, a perfume type of bottle, and it's possibly more sophisticated packaging, which has got different layers of stories behind it, which not only... Uh, trying to explain how it's made. And your contention is that the consumers are, are attracted to that kind of look, but also with the legend. Exactly. Yeah. It's not a minimalist 1980s type of, yeah. uh, of packaging. It's layers of, of history, it's layers of people behind it, yeah. and it's layers about how and where and, the, and where it's made from. And that makes us feel what? Good? Makes us feel part of a community? Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Or at least it takes you somewhere else. Uh, that uh, you may be sitting in Dusseldorf on a rainy Tuesday and suddenly you're transported to Cuba or, or the Philippines. Stop talking about Cuba. It's one of my favorite places. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is probably a question more directed at you, but I'm going to put it to you, Ron, okay. anyway. Aren't we in South Africa, and you, you distribute liquor, we're, we're a nation essentially of, 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 of brandy drinkers, my understanding is. We drink wine and we drink beer. How does rum fit into this? Uh, how does this yeah. fit into the value chain? So, so South Africa is an interesting market in the sense that we are, um, we, we are quite big by global standards, but we're not one of the biggest. So we're somewhat kind of second tier um, in terms of scale. Um, but what South Africans have been doing happily is learning how to drink spirits from a really young age. So it's Which is a, a good and a bad thing. I mean, probably good for you, exactly. but we're not going to get into the, into the health debate. It's where, not important. Where, where it would yeah. take people, you know, people would normally kind of enter the world of premium brown spirits, be it whiskey or be it kind of, um, you know, high quality rum. They'd normally do that kind of in their late 30s. Um, South Africa and you know, a place like Russia sh share a similarity. We start drinking these things quite, 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 quite young. The South African story has effectively been over the last 10 years, a migration from what people are considering to be less interesting local brandies into what they've considered to be more interesting international scotches. And now what we're starting to see is 
there's a maturation of that and around the edges of that people are starting to look for more interesting expressions of you know effectively scotch drinkers but starting to dabble in irish bourbon interesting you know uh, interesting rum but the challenge is tequilas. to pull them away from the conventional mainstream into a niche to be brand honest, like this. People, how do you do that people are doing it on their own yeah. um, there's a I think we're a, we're a far wealthier society, much more globally aware society than we obviously were 20, 30 years ago. And there's a kind of curiosity in, in drinking now that is just, it's emerged on its own, you know. Um, you, you now stand and if you go into a kind of a high-end liquor outlet and you stand and you watch people, how they're behaving in the aisles. And I mean, we, we've done it in wine, so I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. People stand in front of Al and going, I actually don't want to drink the thing that my dad drank and that I've always drunk. I like this uh, the, this notion of not wanting to drink what your parents drank. I, is this something that's been driven by this Gen X, this millennial generation? So um, the, the old school thinking used to be, you know, you would look at the South African drinks market and you would say, Scotch is big, rum is small, and you know, therefore not, not, not very exciting. Um, what we're seeing is a kind of category ambivalence from people now. So you, you asked who, who's the person who's drinking something like Dom Papa, it's quite difficult to say that they, they wouldn't describe themselves as a rum drinker. They might be, you know, experimenting with gin, experimenting with some bourbons. What they're really looking for is brands with interesting stories to tell. That's the first important piece. The second piece, and a somewhat or distant second, is you know what category is it, and it's much much less important. You might find them kind of collecting interesting sort of discovery brands like uh, like Dom Papa, and they might be from some what we would consider to be some pretty random categories. What's the story behind this brand? It was a, a light bulb moment. I found myself in... It a, always is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I found myself in this little island lost in the... There's 7,000 islands in the Philippines, and there's one island which... And this is a real story, is it? It's a real story. Okay, all right. And it just lives You can off attest to that? It's a real story. It just yeah. lives <laughs> off sugar. It's a yeah. sea of sugar. They call it Sugarlandia locally. And um, I was there one day with some friends having, having lunch, and we're in this old crumbling mansion. Yes. Uh, the old and, friends with lunch story, yeah, and, been there before. Yeah. And it got a little hot and I started daydreaming and I suddenly thought, this island's got everything. It's just got this sea of sugar, as far as the eye can see. It's got these amazing beaches, it's got this huge volcano which dominates everything. It's got a few gorillas in the hills with their AK-47s, but without paraphrasing Johnny Depp, where's the rum? And so that was the idea, was to create a rum that's just from this How island. How do you create a rum? Uh, you have a bit of luck. <laughs> you need time and but patience. But what are you chasing? Are you chasing? A, are you, it's a unique taste that you're. That you're it's a unique for? taste. I mean, yeah. the Filipinos have been making rum for yeah. 150 years, yeah. so they're a big. I think they're the second biggest rum producer in the world. So there's a rum, a genuine rum culture there. Sugar grows in the wild there, so actually sugar came from that part of the world originally. So there's a genuine rum culture there. So we started working with a local distillery uh, and um, making our own blend, if you like. Um, and then you need a story, and there's a wonderful uh, character that we found in the archives of the island's history called Papa Isio. And um, he was the main uh, freedom fighter that helped free the island from the Spanish in their war of independence. Tailor made, isn't it? Um, yeah. And when the Americans invaded, he was the last one to surrender. And so we loved his spirit, and he helped inspire uh, the name. And the labeling? And the labeling. And the labeling was a little agency in New York uh, called Stranger and Stranger that I'd known for some time. And uh, when I rang them up and told them about the story, they just said, we love this breed. Now give us a month, leave us alone, and let's see what we can come up with. And uh, they came up with this wonderful, wonderful design. Where does this leave the so-called mega brands then, uh, Rowan? I mean, are they, I mean, th they're a volume business. So, I mean, how much of a threat is a brand like this going to be to, uh, to some of the big hitters? It's really difficult to tell, actually. I mean, I think if you look at, you look at the amazing fragmentation we've seen in all other consumer goods, the world of drinks is basically do doing that. And, you know, craft beer is an interesting one because, you know, we now live in a world where that genie's out the bottle. Yes. Has it really impacted SAB's business? Well, ABI in our business, probably not. Actually, you know, we're a we're a country. Yes and no. I mean, it, 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 they're certainly aware of it, and it, it's it's they an are. encroaching yeah. threat. And in the US, small. and in yeah. the US, that it has you know materially kind of impacted their, their business. Um, I I don't know is is, is the is, is the answer. But what I do know is that once that once that genie's out the bottle, it never goes back into the bottle. We never go back to a world where we all drink 
you know, one brandy, one vodka. We're living in a world now where, the, where people demand kind of choice in all these categories. Now, I'm assuming that this is a kind of a, a word of crowd marketing strategy, is that you're not, I'm not going to see big billboards or big uh, television commercials, probably that and a bit of social media, yeah? That world's changing so quickly as well, isn't it? This, this brand, I think if you, if you sort of plaster the country in billboards, I think you'd, you'd probably destroy its magic. You know, what it needs is it needs you to discover it. That's that, a mystery. That, that, that's kind of part of it. And then once you've discovered it, you, you sort of start to understand the story and then you tell someone else and you allow them to discover it. And that's, that's the kind of business model. So, very quickly, what's the best way to drink this? How do you like it? I like it on the rocks. Yeah? Okay. Just get a rock glass, fill it up with ice. and Stephen, you are so boring. And what about you? Jeez, I'd, I'd, I'd say on the rocks as well. Um, we, 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 I mean, we, we're in a hot country here, so I'd say lots of rum, lots of rocks. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. It's always fascinating to learn about a new brand that is challenging the South African market. Appreciate your time. Thank Good you very luck. much. Thank Pleasure you. to be here. Okay. And that is our story for this week. You can get in touch with us on all of our social media platforms on next week's program, The Mind Shift Made by Journalists Who Set Out to Write Books. Mandy Wiener, Lokanu Kalata and Yan Yan Yuber will join us for an in-depth discussion. Until then, goodbye to you and thank you for watching.